as we look at what is happening, and I believe, as Pastor Jack was saying, I think it's going to accelerate. And I believe we're going to see things unfolding very quickly. And we need to have, I think, the proper frame of mind and understanding of what our role is. And so we're going to look at that this morning. There was a, a recent report by Security Gauge. It's a crime risk assessment platform, and they collate data on violent crimes in the United States. And they came out with their top 10 list of the most dangerous cities in the United States. And topping the list was Besmer, Alabama, followed by Monroe, Louisiana, in my home state. And tied for third was Memphis, Tennessee. And, and so there was a, a, a TV station there in Memphis that was out interviewing a local resident about the violence in the city. And I want you to see what happened. If you'll turn your attention to the screen. Well, we report about the city's crime problem almost every day. But today, that problem hit home for one of our crews while doing a story about crime in Whitehaven. We were interviewing a woman about the Memphis PD's plan to enforce the city's teen curfew when out of nowhere, a drive-by shooting across the street. Watch. Gotcha. Say you spell your name for me. Uh, my name is Yolanda, Y-O-L-A-N-D-A. Get down, get down, get down. Just stay down and get down. That's okay, thank you, Lord Jesus. Just stay down and get down. It's, uh, now they're coming back. Okay. You okay, Jay? Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus yes. that cover us. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right. We should be all right. Bye-bye. Oh. Yep. Oh. You saw it, the black car. So this woman that was being interviewed, you hear her comforting the male reporter <laughs> who was apparently trying to crawl underneath the car assuring him that it was going to be okay. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Let me ask you this morning, are you under the blood of Jesus? If you are under the blood of Jesus, it's going to be okay. If not... Today may be your last opportunity to come under the blood of Jesus so that it will be okay for you both here and in the future. You know, according to the word of God, what Yolanda was doing there is what the church should be doing in this hour, comforting the world that's anxious and, and, and afraid and uncertain. You and I have the ability to have confidence, to have peace, and to be able to minister, I believe we are moving into a period of time that could be the greatest ministry opportunity of the church in the last 2,000 years. This is the moment God has entrusted to us, but we must be prepared. Now, Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, was telling believers in Thessalonica that there are going to be some challenges ahead. And I'm telling you this morning, there are going to be some challenges ahead. You know, I'm, I'm always frustrated by, by churches and pastors and others who will issue an invitation to people to, to follow Christ as if it was going to be a picnic. It's not a picnic to follow Christ. In fact, that's why he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You know, a cross, he wasn't, it wasn't some kind of jewelry, that, some bling to hang around your neck. It was a source of death. And so people get be bewildered when they run into difficulty. If you're following Christ and you're not facing difficulty, I, I have to question whether or not you're following Christ, especially in our culture today. So Paul says there's going to be some challenges, but don't be shaken. Don't be deceived. Rather, stand firm. So if your Bibles, turn with me uh, to 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. But as you're turning there, let me provide little context to this passage. Paul had spent just a short time in Thessalonica during his second missionary trip where he encountered strong opposition. He left and he went to Corinth where he stayed for about 18 months. He sent Timothy back to check on the 
the believers there in Thessalonica, see how the church was doing, and he gets this glowing report from Timothy. So he writes them his first letter in about 51 AD, which we know as 1 Thessalonians. Shortly thereafter, he writes the second letter to deal with either a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of what he had communicated to them about the coming day of the Lord. Some thought that the, the end of the world had begun or was about to commence and that the Lord was going to come back and he was going to sit in judgment at the earth right at this moment. Now the result were that some people were literally basket cases, violently shaken in their minds. Others had stopped working and were just waiting around. And Paul had to correct these behaviors because they were hindering the work and the witness of the church. So in this chapter, Paul lays out what will happen before the end comes, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and sits in judgment. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore, brethren, stand firm. And hold their traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And you have said that your word will not return unto you void. So this morning, we look to your word, not to the wisdom of men, but to your word. And we ask the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, to lead us into all understanding of your word and its application to our lives today. That, Lord, we might stand firm in this hour, bringing honor and glory to you and pointing those who are lost to the source of eternal hope. Holy Spirit, have your way here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What I want us to look at very quickly this morning is this. In the day of spiritual apostasy, lawlessness, and abandonment of truth, how are followers of Jesus to stand firm? How do we do that in in a day when You know, truth is relative and evasive, and we have really just craziness going on in the world around us. How do we stand firm? Well, Paul provides the answer in this passage, but 
Let's first look at what Paul says believers are going to encounter in those days leading to the end times, which I believe we are presently in. Number one, he talks about there's going to be a great apostasy. In verse three, let no one deceive you by any means unless the falling away comes first. What does he mean by this falling away? Well, there's going to be a departure from the faith. Timothy writes, Paul writes about this to Timothy in chapter 4. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I mean, have you noticed that You know, not eating certain foods foods has become kind of a virtue signal. You know, it's almost become a religion. He goes on, for every creature of God is good, tasty, and nothing is to be refused if received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, I don't want to shock you, but, but, but I am a member of PETA. People eating tasty animals. Now, I don't go as far as some of my friends in Louisiana. I don't do roadkill, but I eat. uh... God made it. We thank him for it, and then we eat it. But this apostasy, this falling away is taking place right before our very eyes. We've seen this deconstruction. Have you heard? heard of these uh, different Christian celebrities who are announcing they're deconstructing their faith. Now, I have to question whether they ever had the faith to deconstruct. But I was reading an article from a, a, a young woman who was kind of journaling her deconstructionism of her faith. And I'm just going to read from her article that she wrote. She said, the spark that began my Christian deconstruction. My own journey of deconstruction began well before I was aware of it as a high schooler on various social media sites like Tumblr and MySpace and surrounded by peers coming from backgrounds and walks of life completely foreign to me, I began to see that my worldview was much too narrow to encompass so much of life. Now, that should send off kind of warning signs. If I recall correctly, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said something about the narrow gate. There's nothing wrong with the narrow way, and that's the way that God has pointed us in. I think some people have become so open-minded, their brains have fallen out. (laughs) She continues, what really got my attention was the multiple friends and acquaintances throughout those four years who embraced gender identities and sexualities much different from what I had been brought up to understand. She continues, as I continued into college and even beyond, I realized that I myself may not be who I thought I once was. I am now at a place in my journey where spirituality isn't urgent to me anymore. I am no longer in a race against time to save every non-Christian person I know. You know, it isn't, isn't it interesting, and, and this, this is pretty much across the board, how sexual identity and all of this debate about gender factors into so many of these deconstruction experiences. So what happens, the Bible doesn't conform to what we think and what we want, so there is this defection, a walking away from the faith, and a deconstructionism is simply an attempt to justify a falling away. And I know that, look, this is a tough issue. I deal with it every day. And I know that there are many parents and grandparents that are struggling because their kids have been taken in by this social contagion of gender confusion and they're, they're wanting to, you know, identify as someone else. And parents, and I talk to them all the time, parents, how do we deal with this? God created them male and female. Now, we love them. Never have I ever encouraged a parent to walk away from their child. We should never walk away from our children. We should be there standing on the truth, loving them, 
just as the prodigal son's father loved him waiting for them to return to the truth, praying that they would return to the truth, standing as a witness to the truth. But if we compromise the truth, where will they go when they have reached the end? You see, that's the problem. Many parents want to, well, I just, I, I, they feel like they have to choose between God's word and the choices that their children or grandchildren are made. That's not true. You embrace both. You embrace your child and you embrace the word of God, praying that they would come to the fullness of understanding of God's word. You know, this falling away, this deconstruction, before this became a fad, uh, Ken Ham, founder of Answers in Genesis, wrote a book probably 20 years ago, entitled Already Gone. Now, the, the premise of the, the book counters this prevailing idea that young people lose their faith when they go off to college. That, you know, somehow it's just when they go to college, that's where they're robbed of their faith. The reality is their faith was already gone. Because in our churches, we have been teaching Bible stories rather than biblical truths. Bible stories will not sustain you in the storms of life. Only biblical truth can do that. And we need to be focusing on our children to teach them the truth of God's word and how it applies to our lives. George Barna, who is a researcher, is on, a senior fellow at the Family Research Council, has done a lot of study on worldview. A worldview is shaped and formed between 15 months of age and 13 years of age. Why do you think those on the left want early childhood education? It's not to help you out. It's to indoctrinate children even earlier and build their secular anti-God worldview into their hearts and minds. And that's why parents, reinforced by the church, need to be teaching their children to know the Lord, to love the Lord, and to walk with the Lord through his word. You know, it doesn't stop when we walk away from the faith. There's not like there's this despiritualized zone where there's just no values. It's some of you, I can look at you, you remember Bob Dylan. <laughs> I remember him, so I, I, I reflect that comment. He had a song, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. The reality is there's no spiritual neutrality. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. It's that simple. The new atheist Richard Dawkins essentially admitted this in an interview on Easter morning of this year. Dawkins who has spent much of his life driving Christianity from the public space, acknowledges that cultural Christianity has been good for society. What he was saying is he welcomes the fruit of Christianity, but not the truth of Christianity. And he's now lamenting the demise of the Christian culture because it's being filled with evil forces. Well, the reality is, you can't have the fruit of Christianity without the truth of Christianity. And all of society, he acknowledges in his way, all of society benefits by the Christian faith. Western civilization is built on the truth of God's word. It is Christianity that has given freedom to more people than anything in the history of mankind. We need not apologize. We simply need to advance that truth. There can be no moral neutrality. This idea that you and I need to back up and check our faith at the door of entering the public debate over whatever the issue may be is a lie from the pit of hell. We have every right to enter in to that world outside the doors of this church using the truths and principles and word of God to engage the shaping of our culture in our country. 
See, this, the path of departure from truth, which our society is on, leads to a devotion to deceiving spirits. And Jesus warned of this in Mark chapter 13, verse 5. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. Multiple times as Jesus was talking and, and warning his disciples about what was to come, he says, take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. Do not be deceived. Now, what form does this deception come in? Well, in James chapter 3, verse 15, it says, This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. What we're seeing today is the advancement of the doctrine of demons. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. We live in a time when great discernment is needed. You and I, as followers of Christ, need discernment by what we listen to, where we get our news and information, and who we follow. And what is the test? What is the acid test in discernment? Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it is the Word of God. You and I in this day, must be tethered to the truth of God's Word. Now, it doesn't happen by having this on your shelf. It doesn't happen by you having it on your desk. It happens by you having it in your heart. We need to abide in Christ. That is the source of our power. That is where the fruitfulness of our life comes from. And that means we have to not only be in the Word, but the Word has to be in us. Amen. And I know many of you here in this church obviously know the Word because Pastor Jack preaches from the Word. But let me just ask you this. If you just had one meal a week, how would you be doing? Not too good. You need to be in the Word of God every day. Every day. Especially what we are moving into. People ask me all the time, Tony, how, how do you survive in Washington, D.C.? How do you keep your demeanor? I mean, how is it you just don't, like, blow up? I'm in the Word of God. Every morning. I am in the Word of God. Because it is our source of strength. It encourages us. It puts everything into perspective. And it is a source of our joy because I'm abiding in Christ when I'm in His Word. And if you don't have a Bible study, I, enjoy, I invite you to join us on our journey. We have a two-year journey through the Bible called Stand on the Word. And if uh, you don't have a Bible study, a regular Bible study, I invite you to join us. In fact, we've got a, uh, you can uh, text the word Bible to 67742 uh, to uh, stand on the word with us. In fact, we're moving into the book of Joshua. It's laid out to where it's just a, about 15 minutes of reading each day. But I challenge you, get in the word of God. Somehow, some way, every day you need to be in the word of God. This great apostasy, this falling away is paving the way for what comes next. And I believe this is where we're moving. It is the great revolt. In verse 6, And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. We are seeing the spirit of the lawless one at work. Now, he's not here yet. He's not been revealed, but the stage is being set. And this is the characteristics of the lawless one. He opposes God. Do we see that happening in our society today, opposing God? 
The next thing he does is he puts himself in the place of God. Do we see that happening in society today? Yes, we do. The lawless one, the antichrist. This will be a time of great political and spiritual conflict. He will war against heaven itself. And so as we move toward this point in history, which I think we are entering, we must expect greater political and spiritual conflict and spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. This will not be one with anything except spiritual weapons. We, we, we war against not flesh and blood, Paul says. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That is our battlefield. And if you don't think this is happening, let me read you the proclamation from the White House issued for Easter Sunday. <laughs> Quote, on Transgender Day of Visibility, we honor the extraordinary courage and contribution of transgender Americans and reaffirm our nation's commitment to forming a more perfect union where all people are created equal and treated equally throughout their lives, end quote. Now, when some of us began to criticize the White House for issuing this proclamation for Easter Sunday, the media came to their defense, the legacy media, and said, well, it just so happened that March 31st was Easter, and for the last three years, March 31st has been Transgender Visibility Awareness Day, so it wasn't intentional. All right, we've just been celebrating Easter for the last 2,000 years. What's a priority for this administration? It is placing their ideology above the truth of God. We are seeing this revolt take place right before our eyes, and we have to have the discernment to see it. Now, this stuff doesn't just happen. I don't think he realizes the depth of what he is saying here, but President Biden, in these words that I'm about to show you, actually is speaking truth. Again, I don't think he knows that. He's not aware that he's speaking truth. God help him. Look at the screen. This campaign isn't just about winning votes. It's about winning the heart and, yes, the soul of America. To overcome these challenges, to restore the soul and secure the future of America, requires so much more than words. A reminder that we remain in an ongoing battle for the soul of America. I ran for president because I believe we're in a battle for the soul of this nation. We remain in the battle for the soul of our nation. When I look around at all of you here today, I know we'll win that battle. We need to listen to those words. There is a spiritual battle raging for our nation and for the world today. But what he is saying is there is a battle for the soul of our children. And that battle is raging. In fact, that last clip was from the White House where he held a transgender day with children promoting the unspeakable things that they're doing to children by cutting off healthy body parts and putting them on irreversible drugs to further a radical anti-God agenda where they're putting themselves in the place of God. This is unfolding right before us. We need to have the discernment to see it. And we must begin to use our spiritual weapons that God has given us to counter this godless agenda, this revolt against truth. And what are those weapons? Amen. The Word of God. The Word of God, prayer. We need to be spending time every day in prayer. Fasting. I know everybody loves fasting. <laughs> you, you ought to try it sometime. Though. Invite somebody over for a fast. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper and easier to fix. <laughs> Praise and worship. We need to be praising God. 
We need to, it, almost everybody has an iPhone. I, I hope your playlist is filled with praise and worship. We need to be praising God. It is a weapon. And then our testimony. Your testimony of what God has done in your life is a weapon against the forces of darkness. You need to share your story. You need to tell your story. Everybody's into stories these days. Well, your story is just as valid as anyone else's. Share with your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends what God has done in your life. He says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out. The Antichrist is not here, but the stage has been set. There is some debate among scholars as to what Paul is referring to here when he talks about the one restraining. Some suggest it's civil government rooted in the moral law of God, while others say it is the church and the Holy Spirit. I actually do not see the two in conflict, but rather I see them in concert. It is the presence of the church, individual believers, in which the Holy Spirit dwells, the presence of which shapes and informs our government. You and I, filled with the Holy Spirit, should be working to get government that restrains evil, electing men and women who know the Lord Jesus Christ and are willing to stand on his word. That's what we should be doing. And that restrains evil. When we talk, and and it begins even before that, It's not just civil government, but it's self-government, it's family government, it's church government. When aligned with God's word and his ways, these God-ordained institutions restrain evil. But as we see today, lawlessness advances as faith and obedience to God recedes. That void will be filled with something. Each one of us, living in obedience to the word of God, restrains evil. You yourself, by choosing to follow God and obey him, you are restraining evil. I was in a Walmart. Don't go there very often, but I was in a Walmart store a while back. My wife and I, it's the only place we could get what we needed to get. So we go in, and I always try to go in quickly because somebody's going to see me and want to start talking. And I don't mind talking to people. It's just I was in a hurry. And we were walking down an aisle, and I see a mother with three small children. They were probably ages eight to five. And the the littlest one was a boy, and he was being a boy. And he was trailing behind the others, and he was apparently doing something he wasn't supposed to do. And his mother corrected him, and this is what she said. And I I almost dropped my Tostitos when, uh, (laughs) when she said this. She said, where is your self-government? Exercise your self-government. That is profound because it is self-government that restrains evil. If we had more self-government in this nation, we wouldn't have as much civil government that is costing us an arm and a leg. You know, John Adams, the second president of the United States, says our Constitution was made for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. If we will not govern ourselves, we will be governed by tyrants. We must return to that understanding that we are the restrainers of lawlessness. And God has placed us here. And until he takes us home, that is our role. Well, the results of this apostasy... In 2 Timothy chapter 3, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. See, this is why we must pray. And this is why we must vote. We must vote and influence the culture around us. Now, this great revolt will lead to the great delusion. And I can see why Jack's always saying he's having to move quickly. That time clock is moving fast. The great delusion, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Right? I mean, a newsflash here, Satan is real and he is at work. And he is working in our 
communities and in our culture, with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, what, what leads to this delusion? A rejection of the truth. Jesus, a rejection of the word of God. That brings about this delusion. And this, this big lie, for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the big lie. The big lie is not about the 2020 election, right? The big lie is the usurpation of God, his word, and his authority. Romans chapter 1, verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The big lie is this, that we as human beings define truth when in reality truth is the foundation of the world. The big lie is that we can determine our own gender when God is the one who made male and female. The big lie is the claim that we are God and he is not. So in this age in which we're living, how do you and I keep from being deceived? We stand on the word of God. We must stand firm on the truth. Therefore, brethren, stand firm and hold the traditions, the teachings, the doctrine by which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. The truth of God's word inoculates us against the virus of deception. In the day of spiritual apostasy, lawlessness, and abandonment of the truth, how are we as followers of Jesus to stand firm? We are to pray and to hold fast to the word of God. Therefore, brethren, stand firm and hold the traditions and doctrines which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Mark Chapter 13, verse 33, take heed, watch and pray, that you do, for you do not know the time, but you know the seasons. We don't know the date, we don't, but we know the season, and we know how to prepare. We need to pray, and we need to stand on the word of God. And we need to vote. We need to be engaged. We don't need to be standing around like the Thessalonians, waiting for the Holy Ghost bus to pick us up and take us home. That's coming. But in the meantime, we are to occupy until he comes. He says to the Thessalonians that he may establish you in every good word and work. That means you are to be out there influencing this world until he calls you home or he comes and gets us all. And it's not enough to have faith. You need to act on that faith. Faith without works is dead. We are the salt of the earth, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. We need to season this world. And then we are to stand. At the end of the day, no matter who is standing with us, we are to stand. There, there is no despiritualized zone. There is no middle ground. We are either for the Lord or we are against him. And he is calling us to stand upon and for the truth in this hour. Therefore, my brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. And he tells this to the Ephesians in chapter 6. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, we are moving into a very challenging time. But in the midst of this, the Lord's plan for you and for me is to have peace and joy if we're standing on his word. Because this is a moment when you and I, in standing firm on his truth, others are going to see and wonder, how in the world can you be at, at such peace? And Peter says, be prepared to speak of the hope that's within you. This could be the greatest harvest 
as we move into this time of uncertainty where everything is being shaken, where you and I are standing on the eternal rock, we can point men, women, and children to the truth. Let me very quickly close with this. One of my favorite accounts from history is from John Quincy Adams. Something unique about John Quincy Adams, he was president of the United States. He only served one term because he was a, he was a Puritan. He didn't play politics. He, he knew the Lord and he served the Lord. And he realized that, you know, he was just, the Lord moved him to someplace else. He would move him someplace else. He was one of the greatest diplomats that we had. But after he served one term as president, he did something that no other president has ever done before or since. He ran for Congress, and he served for nearly two decades in Congress. And the reason he ran for Congress is that he wanted to see slavery ended. And so he would bring up this issue. He saw that that was a scourge on America, and it, was, it threatened America's future. And so he would constantly be bringing up this issue. And so in 1836, Congress passed a, what they call the gag rule that said you can't even bring up the issue of slavery. And so a reporter came to him, I, maybe it was a CNN reporter, I don't know, <laughs> said, Mr. Adams, you've lost. Are you ready to give up? You can't even talk about slavery anymore. And that's what you've said is your life's objective is to see it ended. And this is what he said. Duty is ours. Results belong to God. With what we're moving into and where we stand today, duty is ours. Obedience to God, standing firm upon his word is our duty. The results, they belong to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're in our midst. And we just pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds as we conclude our time here together this morning. We again lift up Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and we pray, Lord, that in this time you would manifest yourself to them in ways that are undeniable. We pray for this country, that we would stand firm with them as an ally. But Lord, I, I pray that at the core of that, that your people, those who name the name of Jesus Christ, would stand firm upon your word that, Lord, we would be a rock to this nation in this storm. And, Father, we pray for a great harvest of souls. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. If you'll stand with me and continuing in prayer, I want to pray for you before I leave. Your head's bowed, every eye closed, just in a, in a total dependence upon the Lord. You'd say... I want to stand firm. I want to be one of those that, that stands firm in this season. I want you to lift up your hand because I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for all of those hands all across this sanctuary this morning. They're saying, I want to stand firm. Lord, I want to stand firm. My hands are raised. I don't want to be shaken. And so I want to be in your word. I want to be prayerful. I, give us a greater hunger and thirst for your word. And Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit here this morning, that courage and boldness to stand and proclaim truth in the love of Jesus Christ would prevail and overflow in our lives this morning. I thank you, Father, for that. You can put your hands down. One more thing. You're here this morning, and you're not under the blood of Jesus. Your heart is anxious because you don't know what the future holds for you. If you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, today needs to be that day. If you'd like to invite him into your life to be your Savior and your Lord, I want you to slip up your hand right where you are, and I'm going to pray for you. Just, just slip up your hand. You want to know Jesus. You know you need him. I see that. Yes, yes. Others, yes. Yes. Others. 
yes. All right, I, I want everyone else to start praying. Just bow your heads and pray. Those who have lifted their hand, I want you to look at me. Just look up here at me. Yes, just look at me. Everyone else, I want praying. Yes, I see that. Yes, yes. All right, I want you to pray along with me. I see that in the back, yes. Just, just look at me. Let's pray. God in heaven, this morning I know that I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and to save me. And I declare that from this day forward, Jesus will be the Lord of my life. Help me through the power of the Holy Spirit to stand firm on your truth. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.